All right, this is the continuation of a rigid box structure one. I'm going to do uh, renderings of the box that we had developed. Uh, the original tutorial was a 3D data file to build the structure and the bottle to make sure everything was going to work, uh, saved out layouts, and then made a foam core model to prove out the geometry. So now I'm going back to the 3D file, and I'm going to do some texture mapping and uh, rendering to make uh, nice uh, visual images of the structure. So I'm starting with the bottle. So let's just take a look at that quickly. Um, in bottle building can be very complex. So I have a whole series of different tutorials on how to do that. But I'm just going to roughly talk about taking one of these and moving it along into a rendering. So I'll just do some quick renderings of this so we can just talk about how it's made. All right, so I have the glass structure on the outside. I have a revolve up the top that has that wax kind of closure over the cork. And then we have a nice thick bottom of the glass. So this is, an, I had built all this and I created a wall thickness on the glass. And then I created another piece of geometry, which is actually represents the whiskey on the inside. So it's a little bit of a process to do that because we're looking through the glass and uh, the whiskey is slightly translucent and we have this thick bottom. So this is what the rendering looks like from the front view. So let's go back into uh, wireframe and I'll show you the part on the inside. All right, so there's that's the represents the whiskey on the on the uh, that was on the inside. So instead of uh, making a wall thickness, I have, we have a tool to make a to thicken the wall of the glass. What I did instead was I just uh, offset the entire bottle, and then I cut off the bottom, and I cut off the top, and made uh, another piece of geometry that I differenced from the glass, so I could maintain that thick bottom and then also open up the neck. So it's a little bit of a process, but ultimately I ended up with this solid uh, that fits inside this piece of glass. It's actually, you know, the wall thickness of the glass is probably about 60 thousandths. I made this about 10 thousandths smaller than that. So it's not touching the glass when it's in position. Uh, that way it allows the glass material to be very apparent along the edge. It's like a little nuance to kind of cheat it a little bit to make it a little bit better looking than actual reality. All right, so let's just go back. I'm gonna undo that move and keep that right there. So just to refresh our memories, I'm gonna go back to the actual box structure, uh, which is right here. Okay, so that's just the bottle in, and wireframe sitting in there. But this is the box structure that we're gonna render. So now that I have the bottle ready and it's ready to be rendered, I'm gonna put that in, keep that inside the structure here. I'm gonna do some texture mapping on this box part. So I'm gonna briefly show how some of that might work. So let's go back to um, I'm just gonna take the bottle out for a second. box for texture maps. And then let's get rid of that. Okay, so once that was made, I needed to derive the parts that are gonna be texture maps so we can see them. Uh, so sometimes I'll just separate that. It's just easier to map and then I'll reassemble. So I took out the wooden part here, uh, that's way over on the left. I just said that's the outer section. And then I took the base and then that top insert, which holds the bottle of the neck. Those were separate parts, that was okay. But I derived these internal panels, uh, the back panel and then that curved panel on the left here. because those are gonna have a different color than the wood. That's sort of re reality. So this outside wooden part would be made and then inside it would be lined with this other material, this kind of this gold flocked material. So just by separating this out, I can come in here and texture map them individually, and then I'll reassemble it and then open it up and make uh, the renderings. So with texture maps uh, up in our, our little cube areas up here where we have our materials, we can bring in texture maps. So I'm just gonna talk about that briefly. I had these already in, but I'll show you how I got them. 
So up here in uh, under color map, at the very bottom, let's see, actually it's normally it's plain color, but at the very bottom you have color map. So if you select that and then you go to options, uh, you have this window that comes up and this is where you press load. So I have just gone on the web and I found a bunch of these little swipes <clears throat> of these different materials. Uh, you can go buy texture maps. It can get relatively expensive. Uh, texture maps are usually set up so they can be tiled. Uh, like one of these uh, squares is set up. So if you take these squares and you put them next to each other in multiples, you won't see the edge. It'll look like one seamless wood grain or brick texture or whatever it might be. Um, but those are uh, procedural maps that you have to pay for. I don't like to pay for them. So I just sort of grab stuff that I find and I just sort of stretch it and, and distort it and get it to work. Uh, so I found some that worked pretty well for the situation so I can explain that. So all you have to do is just double click on this and these are JPEG images, it's gonna cancel and it brings in. So this is one of the maps that I got to work. Uh, it's kind of a nice deep reddish uh, wood grain finish. So once you have that, you just say, okay. And then the map is in here and we can control some of these things on here. I can you know, make it uh, shiny or not shiny or translucent. <clears throat> I think I kept this on, uh, on the shiny side. Excuse me, because I think it's going to have a little bit of a finish on it. All right, so once that's in, then you have that. So I have the two parts here in gray, and then I have them already mapped over here on the left. So it's going to go through this process. So I am going to just click on this map, and I'm going to just drag that over and put it right on this part. So right now, it just put the texture map on there. And you can see the, the, uh, the wood grain is all over the place. It's kind of crazy. So we have to go in there and modify that a little bit. So if we come down here under the little uh, paint can under attributes, there are these two little brick cubes. Uh, the second brick cube that has the arrow on it, that's where we can text, we can uh, edit these textures. So if you click on that and then click on your part, uh, this dialog box over here on the side will come up. Now there's different ways to do this texture mapping and orienting it. So the orientation is critical. Origin, you don't have to worry about because it automatically put it right on our part. But if you ever needed to, we could move that around. And this is under cylindrical. So we can have cylindrical mapping, flat and cubic and UV coordinates. So I'm gonna do flat, but I'm going to play with the angles. So now it's starting to, it looks really fuzzy because right now it's like 48 inches and this part is only about I don't know, 16 inches high or so. So I'm just gonna reduce that down. So right now I have, I'm gonna lock the proportions to that map. Because remember it is a square. So I'm going to come under here with this 48 inches. Let's put, I'm just gonna put like 12 and let's see what starts to happen. Okay, so it starts to happen. I can kind of see there's like a little edge right here in the middle. That's where the two cubes are sort of meeting. So it's not a continuous map. So it's not as nice. So I have to move this around and do things with this. So we have that 90 degrees. So it's looking just at the front of our part. So I'm just going to go over here and I'll show you what I did to start to move that around. So I'm going to go with my texture map editing tool over to this part on the left. So I'm going to click on that. And you'll see some of the changes I made. So the 90 degree, I did negative 90 degrees, negative 45, then 180. So we can see this little circle thing here. That's my controls for the texture map. That's on an angle now. So by angling this texture map and having it map into this geometry, it makes the wood grain work better. And I believe I took my lock proportions off and I made it only four inches wide by 18 inches high. So now I won't get any of those seams. This particular texture map, so I'm basically stretching it out and elongating it, but the wood grain looks good. It holds up very nicely, even though I'm distorting it quite a bit. So I can get this to work. So that's what I did over here by setting these up. I set up all these coordinates. Took a little time, I had to play with it, look at it and see how it's gonna work. And I also wanted to look at the back of this part, Let's see if I can get that to move around. So, the, so you can see this part here, it looks really nice, that curved surface. And over here, it's not sitting nice. It's just sort of stretching the map sideways and you get these linear lines. So that's not very desirable either. 
So all that moving around with the coordinates and the proportions and all that can help us get that to uh, the right situation that we need. Okay, so that's that particular map. So I'm just going to go back to my gray. Uh, so this texture map tool that I'm using, it, it's like putting color on there. So if I come back to this and just color this part again, the map will go away. So that was the back and forth. One big part of this was I added on the top here, I added a separate little panel because I didn't want to put angle it up on the top so by doing that i could create a separate little map just on this part so this looks pretty good and the grain looks like it lines up nicely um, but what i did if we move this you can see what's underneath see that has the map is just stretching across the part because i have it on this 45 degree angle <clears throat> and it wasn't mapping on the top there is cubicle mapping, which sometimes can work that out, but I didn't like how it looked. So I'm sort of taking control over this myself and just creating this uh, other little part up here. Uh, but if you do that, um, well, let's put that back. It can look it can look quite nice. So now I have my black lines on here, my edges, because I'm not <clears throat> in render mode. Same thing happened with this gold structure. Uh, I, I brought it in. Uh, I have it here, and I brought that in from the, the collection I had. It's the same thing. It was a, it's just a small square. It's not a procedural map. It's not designed to be tiled. Um, so I'm just stretching it and working with it and proportioning it. And I'm doing it separately and on all, the, all these parts. These are separate. This little back part is separate than this part. And this little cubicle area on the top worked really well because it was relatively small. But you can see how it's running on an angle on the top. But that's okay because this whole gold piece is going to fit inside of the wood and we're not going to see that. So I'm just concerned about the parts that I might see, which would be the back, maybe this inside curve, and then definitely this little base where the uh, bottle is going to be sitting. So by going through that whole procedure and mapping this all around and getting that to fit and everything, it worked. So then all I did was take these gold parts when I was done and I just put them inside of the wood and then made the other side and kind of reassembled everything and then put the bottle in so I can uh, create the rendering. Uh, so let's see. Right, so now that we have everything built, we have all the texture maps in there and the bottle is ready and I've set up uh, this point of view. We need to frame the picture um, so we have uh, what we want. I, I don't want it at this uh, large, this is just at a, a full screen right now. So if we're going to display, and then we go into our image options. We can set up the size of our picture. Um, so let's see here. I want to put this at uh, 11, 17. So I'm going to do width 11 and then 17 because we have this nice tall version here. So I usually use 300 DPI. I'm just going to do 100 now just so it just goes that much quicker. But there is our point of our, our frame, our picture frame. So I also have the point of view with the cone of vision that has been set up. So this will be box open. So I can just click on here and it sets that right up. Uh, why is that? Oh, yeah, it's set. Okay, that's good. So I can just go over that really quickly uh, under view. Uh, I usually set this up a two point perspective instead of three. And then we can go to uh, edit cone of vision. So in here, we can control exactly how this is going to look. So we have uh, our three different views, our top, front, and side. And then we have, actually have the three-quarter perspective view up in, the, up in the top here. So we can move this cone of vision around. I'm not going to do that. I guess I can because it won't really matter. So here's the cone of vision. So and this little a red dot here is our eye. So if we move this around, we can change. You can see the point of view being changed and how that works. And then we can open up the cone of vision, spread that out so we see more. So we have control over all of this. And we come to this view down here, and I can look you know, down on the box a little bit more if I'd like. Or I can look straight into the front and, and play with all these different uh, points of view. So this gives us complete control 
over the cone of vision, which is how much uh, keystoning and distortion and perspective that we're going to have. Uh, so this is really, really helpful to be able to do this. So once you get this to a point of view that you like or it's close to, so there's more variations we can make on this. So under view, we just have to deselect cone of vision. And then we are back into our window. So even when I'm here, I can still use my screen uh, manipulations here. I can use this and start to move things around if I'd like. I can move in and out and, and create the view and get it to where I like it. So that's important. So you set up your display image, how big it is. This particular one's 1117. I normally do 300 DPI, that's a nice resolution. And then I play with this perspective and get this point of view exactly where you want that. And then you can save it down here under views. Box open and voila, and there we have it. So with that all set up, that's ready to go. The next thing is your lighting. So it's good to have the perspective, point of view, and the frame set up, and then do the lighting at the end. Now, I've been playing with the lighting as I go, but if you can keep that order, because as soon as you change your point of view, your lighting will be affected. It's like when you're in a photo studio and you put a bottle on the table and you set up all your lights and you take a picture and it's perfect. If you start turning the bottle or looking at it from a different point of view, the light is going to hit it differently. So it's like a, a real situation where you have to do that. So under lights here, I, uh, we have several lights. I might have three or four. I'm just going to turn them on so we can see them. And when we see them, all they are is little arrows, which you can see right here. I'm just going to pull in a little bit. Here they are from the top view. I have these three lights that are from the front, and there they are all over the place. So they're pointing, so glass, and usually these translucent things, you know, like liquor bottles and perfume bottles, uh, take a lot of attention to lighting because you're uh, doing some backlighting, bounce lighting, you know, up lighting, and getting it to really look kind of bright and quite beautiful. It takes a little bit of time. So playing with these arrows, uh, is the way to do that. So if I uh, go into my lighting area here, uh, let's pick one of these, <clears throat> double click on one of my lights, then this dialog box comes up, which gives me more control over that light. So I can control where it is, how it's pointing, and what type of light it is, but I can, its intensity, uh, its location, whether it has shadows, uh, I can make it have color. Uh, there's a lot of different things I can do to this and uh, the wattage output. So I can control all of that for each individual light. So the general rule of thumb is I have my highlight, which is uh, the top light that's coming over my left shoulder. And I will have that with shadows on. And with shadows, I can do soft. Uh, this is hard ray traced. Actually, this should be soft mapped. This is shadows off. Okay, this doesn't have the shadows on it. I'm sorry. I mean, to confuse you, but you can control the shadows and how the intensity works. But it's hard, which is a very rigid shadow, and then very soft and blended uh, types of shadows. There's lots of things we can do with each one of these lights. Uh, so it's, it's it's pretty amazing. So that takes a little bit of time to do this. Let's just uh, do 3060. So you can see see these in there. Uh, this little surface here on the bottom, it creates my reflective surface. So that is one of our um, material parameters that we can work with. Let's see, here it is. I just create this um, circular, it could be rectangular, it could be whatever you want. But if you use catcher, uh, catcher, which is this uh, option where you can just control shadows and reflection. So it's kind of a weird little uh, material, but it's for things like this, where you just want to capture the reflection. So I have my uh, shadow intensity about 19, which is very soft. And then I have my uh, reflectivity about 15, which is very, very subtle. That's out of 100%. So it's just, a, I don't want it to look like a mirror. I want just a little bit of um, reflection down on the bottom. So these are just some details that you have to play with. And that's what makes some of these renderings really work well. 
So let's go back to the uh, views. Uh, hold on. Let's go deselect this. And we are looking for box open. That was it. Box open. And then as I click on render zone, <clears throat> And there it is. So that's a result of all of that effort. So the texture mapping that we have in there and even putting the bottle in the box, some of the reflections have changed because it's sort of like a real photo suit. It's a real situation. This dark area here was not on the bottle when I rendered it by itself because it's actually reflecting the, the box that it's sitting in. So that's sort of a real situation about how that might work. It's not bad. It gives you some uh, interest and uh, visual reflections in the bottle and that. So it looks, I think it looks pretty nice. And then there's that subtle reflection on the bottom. So what I would do is I would render this, save it out as a JPEG and now bring it into Photoshop. And I would just soften that up a little bit uh, you know, with the eraser or you know, the blend tool, the brush tool, and just sort of lighten that up. Uh, I have a little bit of a great graduated background. I, it could be perfectly white or I could put a texture map out there. I could do a lot of different things back there. I keep my backgrounds very, very simple because I want to emphasize the object. I'm not as interested as creating like an advertising type of photo and in, in an environment, in a kitchen or in someone's bar or something like that. I'm just trying to, I just want to talk about the actual object. So that's an example of that rendering. So I would just save this out as a uh, JPEG and then I could use that for uh, multiple different situations. So there, you know, I have a rendering. I can take this and pivot this closed and do the rendering of it. Uh, in its closed orientation also. Okay, so that's a little bit about uh, rendering.